You know, when I complete nearly any revival meeting, I like to share this passage. And I shared it with you following the revival uh, meeting that we had. But uh, you can say this with me. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we possess. For he who promised is what? Faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. That's what the church is all about right there. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see what? The day, capital D, approaching. The day that is referred to from Genesis to Revelation. That day is coming. It's coming for all of us. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. So that day comes where the Lord himself comes to take us home or he sends his angels and we breathe our last breath, our heart beats the last time, and we go. A man that had recently uh, moved into a certain community had visited several churches trying to find a pastor in a congregation that made him feel comfortable. He finally visited a small church near the edge of town and he arrived a tad bit late. He slipped in just as the congregation was reading these words out loud with the pastor. Listen, he says, they said, We have left undone those things we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. So he came in, and that's what he heard. That's the words he heard at the end of their, what they had been saying. The man settled into his pew, and he, he snuggled down with a satisfied smile, and he said, Finally, thank goodness. I found people just like me. See what it says again? We've left undone those things we ought to have done, and we have done those things we ought not to have done. He said, that's just like me. Yeah. Just as people all over the world, they, they've tried to make God into their own image. Have you ever talked to people that have some pretty strange ideas about God? You know, the man upstairs, and whatever they call him, however they refer to him, and what they think they're going to be doing when they die someday in either heaven or hell, you know, how they think they're, they're going to go to heaven or whatever reason. They have their own ideas about eternity, and they have their own ideas about God. They want to make him into their image when all along what? We were made in his image. We fell, and the rest of our lives through the Bible is we're trying to be reconformed into the image of God. And that won't be completed as hard as we try, and that's what the church is for, and the Word of God, that will not be completed until we see Him. Like that song, the other song the cathedral's doing, we've shared, we shall see Jesus, and when we see Him, we shall be just as He is. That day, we will be conformed. If we've trusted Christ as our Savior and Lord, on that day, capital D, then we will be finished being conformed into the image of Christ because nothing impure can see heaven. These old corrupt bodies won't. We'll have new bodies, hallelujah. We'll have new bodies. Wouldn't it have been cool if we could all got the kind of body that Noreen has? 96 years, and she's still going. You know, still going. Wow. Happy birthday this week. Well, the question of what makes up a good church has uh, taken on some significance. You know, just as people try to, to make God over to their own image, everybody has a different idea of what makes up a good church. I mean, we've got, goodness, all the, these different denominations. I brought up this chart today that I have on my wall behind my door, and I see people every now and then, they come in my office, and say, excuse me, Pastor, and they just close the door, and they start reading that. They want to know what this denomination believes and what that denomination believes and how we all have different ideas about what the Word of God says and what God is like. This is just a handful of them. So if this isn't enough, then I have a book here of Handbook of Denominations just in the United States. Several hundred pages. Larry comes and borrows it every now and then. But this is, this is what people have. Everybody's got different ideas about the, what the Word of God says. And, and or just in their own head. They've just made things up. This sounds good to me. We've got a lot of religions out there like that. You know, and that makes, that's taken on some added significance in recent years with the expansion of, of TV evangelism. Have you ever watched TV on church sometimes? Ever? Ever? Well, there's a lot of it out there. Some folks feel they don't even need to leave the comfort of their homes anymore to attend church. They can enjoy it on TV. On top of that, TV has some touch not Top-notch top performers. Top-notch performer. That's, not, that's easier read than said. 
You know, I, I mean worship leaders. That's what I meant to say. They're worship leaders. You know, in some cases, you see, re entertainment has replaced worship altogether in some of those churches. And I've been in a few. Whatever style of music you like, it's on 24 hours a day somewhere on religious programming. Uh, and, and who needs the crowds, you know, with all that touchy-feely kind of church, you know, people coming up and asking you how you're doing. They want to hug you. They, they want to rub their germs off on you and all that, you know, like they really care. Uh, one man was asked, and this is true, one man was asked why he didn't get along with his pastor. And he replied, oh, every Sunday, every Sunday before we leave, before we get to go home, he makes us all hold hands and sing, I love you with the love of the Lord. And I just hate that. I just hate, it makes me so uncomfortable. I actually heard somebody say that one time. The fellowship aspect of that traditional church setting has been challenged by individualism. Why go to the trouble of digging into the Bible yourself? Just believe what fits your personal lifestyle. Whatever you want to believe. And dial into the church program that best suits those beliefs. You can find one out there that's going to be pretty close. And, and why dress up and go mix with a crowd when I can stay at home in my pajamas and watch TV? You know, church on TV. You've seen that, that commercial where the guy's getting ready. He's all getting all dressed up to go get a loan. You know, going to the bank and get a loan. He's in a suit and tie and everything. And his little animated friends. Where are you going? This is how I get alone. He's sitting there in his boxer shorts, you know, on his computer. You know, I don't need to do that. They come to me. That's what people want. They want the church to come to them and the perfect church to come to them. Now listen, people have all kinds of excuses. If I don't like the music or the preacher steps on my toes, I don't have to change churches. I can just change the channel. Nobody's watching to see what I put in the offering plate. There are no crying babies. Nobody's jumping up to go to the bathroom every few minutes. What do you think? That's starting to sound pretty good, isn't it? You know? I'm not against the gospel being shared on TV. Think about it. Millions of people have been reached with the Word of God by, by television and, and by satellite around the world. And for some elderly or disabled folks, what? This might be their best option. I'm just saying that all of us are wired by God for physical interaction. To give and receive love and encouragement. I can yell and scream at the TV while I'm watching a ball game. And you know what? The players, the coaches, they're not going to hear me. They're not going to respond no matter how, how much uh, I yell at them. And the pastor, the worship leader, or any of the elders of that TV church are not going to respond if I turn on their worship service. Or if I turn it off. Or if I say amen, they don't even know if I'm watching or not. They can't give me that personal touch of encouragement. They can't include me by name in my prayers. They're not going to call on me if I raise my hand. You know, they're, they're not going to be there to rejoice with you at your weddings. They, they're, they're not going to hold your hand at your bedside when you're sick or when you're dying. They're not going to be able to conduct your funeral. Call them. See if they will. Now, when it's all possible... Every Christian, every Christian should be an active member in a local church. Amen. Every Christian. Christ formed the church. He loves the church. He even died for the church. Look at Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing of water through the word. What does that phrase mean? Don't just go over that. What does that mean? Symbolic immersion. You know, whenever I hear about baptizing them in the Father and the Son, immerse them in the word of God. Immerse them. That's what that baptizo, that Greek word means. Immersion. Washing through the water of the word. Symbolic immersion, baptizing, cleansing through the word of God. That's what it does in our lives when we come in here each week. We've been out there in the world and it's just all this junk and stuff is sticking to us. And we come here and part of the reason we come, we stand and we pray and we praise next to other people. And we lift our voices together and you hear the word of God and praise the God and all that stuff. It's being washed out of your life and your batteries are being charged. Cleansing her by the washing of water through the word to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish but holy and blameless. Remember, we're being conformed. 
Conformed. Part of what happens, you're conformed to the image of God a little bit more every time you come into this place. Every time you come into this place. I'm trying to remember this story I heard of two men that went home after church. They went, one went to the other's home and the wives were in the kitchen preparing the meal and they're sitting down talking and, and one of the men says, you know, I just didn't get much from the pastor's message today. In fact, I don't know if I've ever gotten anything out of his messages before, you know. And, and the other man sat there and listened to him, waited for him to finish and said, you know, I've been married to my wife for 30 years and in that time I've calculated she's fixed me something like 30,000 meals. 30,000 meals. I couldn't tell you the menu of any of them. But you know what? I'm here because I ate those meals. They've made an impact on my life, you know. I might not be able to tell you everything that pastor's ever preached, but I know it's made a difference in my life over the years. The Word of God just continually, continually, continually will have an impact on your life and on your thinking. Just like working in a workplace where you're continually bombarded by filthy language and rotten behavior. It'll have an impact on you. It'll wear you down, won't it? The same thing with the Word of God. It will build you up. It will encourage you and make a difference in your life. The Lord intended for us to be here. So what are the signs of a good church? We've already mentioned many, but one of the best signs of a healthy church is a pastor who will lead his congregation in a well-balanced approach to worship through prayer, praise, proclaiming the Word of God. These three things are crucial ingredients in every healthy church family. And I've tell, I've tell pastors this when I travel. I said, did you know that you're the worship leader? And he goes, what? No, I have a music man. I said, no, you're the worship leader. You are the one who are, who are responsible for what goes on. You're the worship leader, whether you can sing or not, because you oversee the, and participate in the worship. Ryan and I both have this thing. We've been in churches where uh, somebody else was doing the revival, and, you know, we're up on the platform, the team, we're up there just singing our hearts out and worshiping to the Lord. doesn't matter if anybody else is in the room, but it, sometimes your eyes will fall on the evangelist, whoever's preaching that day. And you know what they're doing more than half the time? They're looking through their notes, looking through their notes, looking over their message. And what's going on all around them? Worship. If they haven't got it figured out by now, it's too late. If they haven't got their message worked out by now, goodness, what were they doing earlier? Worship could, could participate with the people in the worship. You are the worship leader. Well, from the very beginning of the early Christian church, prayer has been a primary means of worshiping God. After all, it's through prayer. I mean, we've talked about some of the things this morning, the answers to prayer. It's through prayer that we express our adoration to God. We express our thanksgiving Philippians 4, 6, and 7 talks to us about that. We need to express ourselves to the Lord and thank Him. Don't ever forget to thank Him every day. Boy, hasn't the last couple days, weren't they gorgeous? I walk outside and I go, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> it's just gorgeous out here. It's fantastic. Thank you. And then I had a, a wasp, wasp nest back on the corner of the parsonage there. So I had Lindy. I said, she called me from Walmart. She says, Dad, what, what should I get? I said, we need some wasp spray. You know that kind that shoots from a quarter mile? <laughs> I want that. She bought a three-pack. She bought a three-pack and brought it home and said, here, Dad. And I took that out, and I stood. It said 27 feet. I went, yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I went and got another bottle, shook it up. Went there, I had to get within six feet of that thing and play the wind on top of that. And those hornets laughed at me. They laughed and they were coming. I was going, I put a wall of that stuff between me. I went out there an hour later, they were all over the place. They were, I was looking on the ground for dead wasps, Coke. There wasn't a dead wasp out there. All of them were still alive and healthy. Two dollars for that three pack. What did that have to do with what I was saying? Oh, yes. I was saying, thank you, Jesus. Well, I was running from those wasps because they were chasing me and it, these old metal hips can still move because that they were just lapping up that stuff I was spraying at them. But I was thanking the Lord uh, at that moment. I thank him for all kinds of things. You know, he, he saved us. He sets us apart from the rest of this fallen world and he's going to one day, we've been singing about this, he's going to deliver us 
from this world. Many times when I'm standing next to a bedside, as I did this week with somebody, I would stand there and I prayed with them. I said, thank you, Lord, that this world is not all there is. We have so much more as your kids to look forward to. And thank you for that, that we have that. You are preparing a place for us, your word says in John 14, 2 and 3. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, you can be also. Jesus himself set a pattern, a simple pattern of how to pray when he taught his disciples to pray in Matthew 6, 9 through 13. I want you to say it with me. And this is the one that's got debts and debtors, okay? I'll tell you ahead of time. Because <laughs> a lot of times people, they kind of back off. Are we saying trespasses? Where this is the debts and debtors from the King James Version. After this manner, therefore pray ye. Say that with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And through prayer, we can also intercede for others. Aren't you glad? I'm glad people interceded for me. I'm, and I'm glad that I have that privilege of being able to intercede for others as well. Scripture urges us because we are to praise as well as pray. Because that's a crucial ingredient in our worship. In fact, that's what a lot of people think worship is, simply is just praise. And that's not true. Our lifestyle, our work, everything can be an act of worship. But we are to praise Him. As the Scripture urges us in Ephesians 5.19, speak to one another with Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You know, singing psalms is a magnificent way of not only uh, praising God, but memorizing Scripture and to intercede uh, for ourselves, for others, all the while learning great biblical truths. I remember uh, a psalm that I learned as a child. The Lord's my shepherd I'll not want. He maketh me down to lie in meadows green. He leadeth me the quiet waters by. You know, I didn't know I was memorizing scripture. I was learning a song. But how much have we learned through songs in our lives? It's a wonderful way to learn through, by singing psalms. And hymns have been a, a way to pass on theological doctrines, great truths from the Word of God about God. They teach us about His majesty, His, his character traits. Uh, hymns are about Him. One of the very first was penned by Martin Luther. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills are, that are prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. Who's he talking about? His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not as equal. People were able to learn about God and the Satan. They were able to learn about the forces of good and, and darkness all in one stanza of the, that great, incredible hymn. Now, on the other hand, a lot of spiritual songs or contemporary songs, are, they're written in such a manner that allows us not only to speak of God, but to what? Express our hearts to God. And I can't find anything wrong with that. Hymns teach us about God. A lot of our spiritual songs, contemporary songs, allow us to express ourselves directly to Him. Like one of my favorites, one of the ones we've just done this morning. I see your face. In every sunrise, the colors of the morning are inside your eyes. The world awakens in the light of the day. I look up to the sky and say, you're beautiful. I've told you about the night times around here. And those of you that live in the, even outside of Wayne, you can look up at night. Isn't it beautiful? The stars when you're away from the city, what you can see. and Your mind goes to God. You cannot help it. Please understand something very important. It's crucial to not only maintain the Christian heritage of the past, but to also respect our spiritual and our contemporary expressions of faith through music today as well. Amen? Amen. You understand that? Some of us like broccoli. Some of us don't. But, I, I may get some arguing about this, but just because you may not like broccoli, that doesn't mean it's evil. Yeah, I knew I'd get some argument. But as humans, 
Every single one of us are created, unique, special, with diversity. I mean, some of you ladies, you like bald guys. You know, some of you, you want the tall, dark, handsome kind. I praise God that no matter how ugly we are, there's some woman out there that's going to look at us like catnip. You know, <laughs> I praise God for that. God made us diverse, diverse. We're all different. And it's that way with music. We all have different tastes. We all have different styles that we like. But that doesn't mean that the other types of music are less important than your preferred style. They can all be used to worship our Creator. Amen? Amen. Along with prayer and praise, proclamation, preaching, teaching the Word of God, just sharing the Word of God with a friend. You can do that at work. Many of you tell me the Lord is opening opportunities for you to fall into conversation about the Word of God with your friends and the Christian lifestyle at work. Praise God. He will give you those opportunities if you're looking for them. It's critically important as an ingredient of worship in every healthy church. The Apostle Paul urged his young protege, Timothy, he said, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience, careful instruction, for the time will come, listen, when men will not put up with sound doctrine or teaching. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. I'm going to turn that channel till I find one that's saying it the way I want to say it. There are some serious loons out there, some sinister ministers <laughs> that are teaching and preaching health and wealth and the power of your own words. You know, just by saying it, you can make it happen. There are some folks that are out there that are trying to teach that. Your word carries more weight sometimes than God's word. That's what some people are, are saying. That's what they're teaching and people are lapping it up. And these guys are getting wealthy in the process. If there was ever such a time when the majority of people do not want to hear the truth, it's today. There's always been that time, but today it's very difficult but all church leaders have to work overtime to produce within their people a hunger for the Word of God. That's something that we like to see. That's what we want to experience. I love it whenever people come back on Sunday night and you see people sitting there with notepads. They're going, I want to learn. I want to hear. I want to eat it up. Teach it to me. And they're back on Wednesday. And they're taking notes. And they're, and they're living it. It has an impact on their life. They're there for three spiritual meals a week. They're getting everything they can. They're coming up for air in the middle of the week spiritually on Wednesday night. That's why they're here. They want to be discipled. They want to be able to make a difference and an impact out there in the world. It's through the teaching of the Bible that people survive and thrive in the fallen world. Sunday school, I love it. The classes, they come together, they can talk back and forth, they can ask questions. One family has been through something, another family is just now starting to experience, they can share that back and forth. Sometimes the Sunday school teacher just sort of sits back and referees or just sits back and lets ministry happen. He knows or she knows when to do that and when to be quiet and just listen and help. And, and the whole time they're watching that ministry happen, the godly Sunday school teacher is sitting there just praying, Lord, yes, let it happen. Let it happen. Healing is taking place here. Some wisdom is being passed back and forth. Don't tell me Sunday school is not important or it's for children. It's for all of us. The pastor's job is to equip the saints to do the work, and so is the Sunday school teacher. It's, that's how we're saved. That's how we're discipled. That's how we're encouraged. That's how we're equipped to do what God has called his followers to do, and that's spread the word everywhere we go. Remember, I said, you know, I didn't say it, but Henry Varley said it years ago to a young Dwight Moody, preach the word. When necessary, use words. Preach always with your lifestyle. Time and again, when the men of this church have taken the time to sit together, to visit over coffee, uh, to share a meal together, as they did in the book of Acts, good things happen. And how many times have we done that, guys, and we say, you know, we need to do this more often. Jesus did a lot of ministry over the table. Well, once again, look with me at the practice of the first church in Acts 2, 42, and verses 46 and 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. 
You're that they devoted themselves to food, <laughs> to the fellowship, to the meal times, to be together and to prayer. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Three times it talks about food. Ministry happening there. Praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people because who doesn't like that? And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Ministry wasn't just happening when they gathered at the temple courts. It was happening all day the time. Why? Because they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. I don't know about you, but you can't get that on TV. You can't. You can't. There are those who feel the church has lost touch and that the message of the Bible is outdated. I'm here to tell you today that the, God has always had a people. Many a foolish conqueror made the mistake of thinking that because he has forced the church of Jesus Christ out of sight that he had stilled its voice and snuffed out its life. But God has always had a people. The powerful current, think about it, of a rushing river, it's not di diminished because it's forced to flow underground. The purest water is a stream that bursts crystal clear into the sunlight after it's fought its way through solid rock. There have been charlatans like Simon the Magician uh, in, the Old, or in the New Testament who sought to barter on the open market that power which cannot be bought and sold. But God has always had a people. Men who could not be bought, women who were beyond purchase, the Lord has always had a people. There have been times of affluence, we've seen it in our lifetimes, prosperity when the church's message was nearly diluted into oblivion by those who sought to make it socially attractive, neatly organized, financially profitable. We're seeing that today. It's been gold-plated, draped in purple, encrusted with jewels. It's been misrepresented, ridiculed, blotted, scorned. But these followers of Jesus Christ have been, according to the whim of the people and the whim of the times, elevated as sacred leaders or martyred as heretics depending on the, on the day. Yet through it all, they're marchers on that powerful army of the meek. God's chosen people that can't be bought, they can't be flattered, murdered, or stilled. They march on through the ages, the church, God's church. It's still alive, it's still well. That is the church triumphant. Are you a part of God's church? Are you fully committed to God's church, or are you a spectator here each week? You know what? It's time to decide before it's too late. Pray with me. Stay tuned in. Before we pray, think about this. Stay, stay tuned in. God gave you a free will to do with whatever you want to do. I told you that a few moments ago. You can play around at church. You can play around at being a quote unquote Christian all you want to. You can act like you're a part of the family of God, but there is just no lasting satisfaction in something that is only pretend. It isn't real. There's no authority behind it. It's just like a magic show. It's all an illusion. It's like two people who haven't yet shared their marriage vows. Think about it. There, there's been no true commitment until they stand side by side and say what? I do. I will. I'm committed to you. Come hell or high water, I am committed. And this is how I'm going to show it. Until you're ready to make that commitment to the church family, when it comes time to take a stand for what you believe out there, or in here for that matter, you're going to fold up like a house of cards, blown over by peer pressure, by public opinion. Are you ready to commit to Christ and be a part of his genuine followers, the church? He committed totally to you and to me when he walked up that hill that he didn't have to walk up. He did that. He committed then surrender to Christ and come on before it's too late. Father, it's black and white. There's no gray area. There's no yeah, but, or if, 
and uh, it's just yes or no. Lord, I'm all in or I'm not. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for absolute truth in a world that says there's a lot of gray areas. Lord, I just pray, it's been laid out there, I pray that those who need to will do with what they need to do. Lord, actually that's all of us. Whether it's just recommit or to commit for the first time or to come to Christ, to accept you as Savior and Lord. Lord, there may be some in this room that have never done that and they can't commit to someone that they've never trusted. I pray that they will believe that you did that for them on the cross of Calvary. That you paid for their sins and that the only way they're going to go to heaven is to believe that, to place their trust in you and you alone and not anything good that they can do. May they do that right now. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together and sing. I surrender.